to the second seminar in our series of Buddhism in the Sea of Islands. So I'm Anna Halifoff and I'm from Deakin University and we are co-hosting this. And in fact, the webinar series is being hosted by Nantian Institute. And also we're working together with Christina Rocha at uh, the University of Western Sydney. Uh, so um, we've come together and formed a network of scholars from around the Pacific region, um, from mainly from Australia and uh, New Zealand and also Hawaii, but we're very much wanting to work with other scholars also within the Sea of Islands. So if anyone is present today and still wishes to join the network, we also have uh, people within our network from Europe and uh, also from North America and um, we're very, very welcome to people coming and participating from all parts of the world. So as is customary in Australia, I'm just going to begin the session formally with an acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to begin uh, this afternoon by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am on today, the Kukuyulanji people, and pay my respects to their leaders past, present and emerging. And it's my great pleasure today to introduce our two presenters, uh, both from Nantian Institute. So Venerable Dr. Zhu Wei Shi carries out teaching and administrative duties in Nantian Institute's Applied Buddhist Studies and Humanistic Buddhism programs. She also directs the research and community outreach activities in its humanistic Buddhism Center. Venerable Zhu Wei's research interest lies in humanistic Buddhism and Chinese Buddhism with a focus on acculturation and application of Buddhist teachings in the modern world. Dr. Dr. Shia Yang Tan is a research assistant in the Humanistic Buddhism Center, Nantian Institute, Australia. Tan trained in science and holds a graduate certificate in humanistic Buddhism with a research interest in transnational flows in Buddhist organizations, modern applications of Buddhist teachings and humanistic Buddhism. So it's my great pleasure to introduce both speakers today who will speak on their research on Foguan Shan in the Pacific region. Thank you, Anna, for the introduction. And thank you to everyone for your presence today. I hope that you're able to see the share screen at this point. Great, thank you, thank you. So over the next um, 15 minutes or so, Xiaoyang and I will present our latest discoveries from studying the flows of innovation in Foguangshan, Australia and New Zealand. We used the Buddhist birthday festivals conducted over the past three decades as the topic of our investigation. Before we begin, just as Anna did, I would also like to acknowledge the Darawal people as the traditional owners of the land on which Nantian Institute resides. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all are. And I pay my respects to the elders past and present. It is also the tradition in my Nantian Institute classes to start with a mindful check-in to allow our minds to settle and prep ourselves for the new information to follow. I'd like to ask for your permission to do the same today, to simply gift ourselves with one minute of noble silence. And I will let you know when the minute is up.
Thank you. As part of the Buddhism in the Sea of Islands series, we set out to look at the flows and counterflows of Buddhism in the region by exploring how a modern Chinese Mahayana order, Bo Guang Shan, promoted Buddhist teachings in Australia and New Zealand. And for the sake of brevity, we shall say ANZ whenever we refer to Australia and New Zealand. So to undertake this presentation, we scope the subject to innovations in the promotion of the Triple Gem, which is the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, in the specific settings of the Buddha's birthday festivals. So to re the research question that we set out to explore is how flows and counterflows happen in the Foguangshan Transnational Network in the Pacific region. So to address this research question, here's the outline of today's presentation. I will first introduce the subjects of our study, the actors, the purpose, and the act itself in the form of annual public festivals. I will briefly introduce our research methodology before handing over to Xiaoyang to speak about how we mapped the flows and counterflows of innovations across the Pacific among the headquarters in Taiwan, the ANZ branches, and other regional headquarters. I will close with our reflections from examining the dynamics of organizational learning that has driven these innovations. Using a system of systems model, we argue that such flows were enabled by Fo Guangshan's culture of innovation and the independent yet collaborative nature of its trans-regional network. And we welcome your questions and comments at the end of our presentation. We'll start with a brief introduction on the organization we're looking at. What kind of Buddhist organization is Fo Guangshan, or FGS for short? And what is the Buddhist Light International Association, or BLIA for short? Humanistic Buddhism is the doctrine upheld or enacted by FGS and BLIA. So what is humanistic Buddhism? What are its tenets relevant to this study? This will then be followed by a brief overview of the celebration of the BBFs or Buddha's birthday festivals at FGS. We will look at its format and features. So if Xiaoyang or I slip into acronyms, please understand that these are the few that we will be using today. So first, the context. In 2001, Martin Bormann introduced global Buddhism. This term to encapsulate the plurality and global globality of Buddhism outside Asia. Bo Guangshan was one such Buddhist organization that went global since the 1970s and met this plurality of Buddhisms in the West. This paper presents the interesting other side view of how a Buddhism that tried to break free from orthodox practices in its homeland encountered postmodernity and ultra-modernity. I know you may be interested in the role women not play in shaping these flows and counterflows. While Bonman made explicit the tensions among traditionalist, modernist, and global Buddhisms in his paper, Roger Finca in 2004 looked at how modern religious groups must constantly strive for a balance between preserving core teachings and innovating to adapt to external contexts so that they can remain relevant to the place and time. So Chinese Mahayana Buddhism in the Pacific region today is the product of and continues to be transformed via this dynamic process. Innovating while preserving the core teachings is a major undertaking that characterizes the activities of Fo Guangshan. So Fo Guangshan is a transnational Buddhist movement founded by Venerable Master Xing Yun in 1967. From its headquarters in Kaohsiung, Taiwan, it has grown rapidly in the last 50 years to become a global network of close to 180 branch temples. The stated objective of Fo Guangshan is to promote the principles of humanistic Buddhism. Jens Reinke, in his recent book, Mapping Modern Mahayana, 
referred to Fo Guangshan as a modernist reform movement of Chinese Mahayana Buddhism. Chandler, in his 2017 book on establishing a pure land on earth, describes how Fo Guangshan does not only serve the global Chinese diaspora, but also engages in missionary work to spread the Buddhist teachings to local communities. We highlight these points to emphasize that despite the immigrant origin of many of its members and a demographic composition of predominantly Chinese background, it would be misleading to consider Fo Guangshan as traditional ethnic Buddhism. We will present evidence later. So Buddhist Light International Association, BLIA, is an international non-government organization composed of largely lay people and affiliated to Fo Guangshan. Founded in 1992, it is headquartered in California and has 200 chapters in over 70 countries and regions. The founder once described the monastics of Fo Guangshan and the laity of BLIA as the wings of a bird working together to, quote, spread the seeds of bliss throughout the world, unquote. BLIA chapters around the world are active in supporting and engaging in collective action and community effort in environmental conservation, charity, cultural and educational work. So today we will present evidence of how the Buddhist birthday festivals present a channel for such to be accomplished. Hmm. Coming closer to home, Nantian Temple. One of the largest Buddhist temples in the Southern Hemisphere opened its doors in Wollongong, New South Wales in 1995. Bokwangshan now has established 10 other temples in Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth, Auckland, and Christchurch. The arrival of Fo Guangshan in ANZ is driven by external and internal conditions at that time. Internally, Fo Guangshan has embarked on an internationalization campaign starting with the establishment of Shilai Temple in California in 1998. In 1988, the master has vowed to spread the Buddhist teachings to all five continents. About the same time, the then mayor of Wollongong invited Fo Guangshan to consider building a Buddhist temple in the area. This also coincided with the Australian Labour government's deliberate multicultural Australia policy that took place from 1982 to 1996. So when Fo Guangshan came to Australia in the 1990s, its outlook and practice were fairly compatible with the contemporary development of Buddhism in Australia which Michel Spuler characterized as pluralism, diversity of practice, democratic principles, and social engagement. So what is humanistic Buddhism? The Kortya. What was taught by the Buddha, needed by human beings, that which purifies and that which is virtuous and beautiful, are the words of the founder. They came spontaneously when economist and cultural entrepreneur, Professor Charles Cao, asked the Venerable Master what humanistic Buddhism is. Since Chinese believe that truth, goodness, and beauty are virtues of the world, it was quite natural that the Venerable Master replied that humanistic Buddhism is the embodiment of such truth, goodness, and beauty. The Chinese term for humanistic Buddhism, Ren Tian Fo Jiao, literally means Buddhism for or in the human realm. Guided by the teachings of humanistic Buddhism, Fo Guangshan engages in not only religious, but cultural, educational, and charity work in society. Reinke observed that such engagements form the core of the order's modernist Buddhist religiosity. Dong Ping suggests that Fo Guangshan's contemporary model of humanistic Buddhism inherits the historical traditions of Chinese Buddhism, integrates Buddhist doctrines and is deeply involved in the current age. It creatively transformed the way Buddhism was spread in ancient times, allowing Chinese Buddhism to be integrated into the greater pattern of world culture while retaining its distinctive features. So let's take a look at the role of innovation for humanistic Buddhism to flourish. In the last slide, we recall that humanistic Buddhism is defined as what is needed by people. 
to respond to the needs of people in contemporary times across different parts of the world, innovation becomes necessary. For transnational Buddhist organization, we also had to study the flow of innovations across regions to gain further understanding on the content, the process, the evolution, and the transmission of innovations. So let's take a look at some humanistic Buddhist attitude to innovations. One, according to Reinke, Bo Guangshan emerged as a Buddhist response to modernizing Chinese societies. Cheng Gongrang noted that among the most commendable reforms and innovations of Bo Guangshan are active advocacy for equal rights between men and women, the great respect for the value of women in Buddhism, as well as the remarkable promotion of the female Sangha. Two, the, this worldly pragmatism of humanistic Buddhism led to interpretation and promotion of teachings by exploiting modern innovations to aid the spread of Buddhism. And three, Cheng regarded the four Guang system as, he quote, I quote, the most successful example of modernization and transformation promoted by various Buddhist traditions around the world, unquote. So we are aware of innovations in Buddhist modernisms examined by many scholars in the field, including McMahon, Chuli, Rocha, and more. For this paper, we, are chose, we have chosen to identify, define, and track a very specific set of innovations in the settings of Buddhist birthday festivals organized by Bo Huangshan in Australia and New Zealand. And in looking at how innovations emerge, flow, change, and get adapted as they flow, we see our contribution as adding the discourse of innovations in Buddhist modernisms by adding the spatial and temporal dimensions to the study of innovations. As you will see in the presentation in the ANZ context, we seldom see doctrinal innovation, but rather innovations that count as skillful means in promoting Buddhism. So why is the celebration of Buddhist birthday given so much emphasis? We think it has to do with the centrality of the historical Buddha in humanistic Buddhism. We will return to this theme later in the presentation. So for almost 30 years, Bo Guangshan ANZ has invested heavily in the Buddhist birthday festival annually in the form of weekend long festivals in public spaces involving months of planning and thousands of volunteers to welcome tens of thousands of visitors. So what does a BBF look like? This is the program pamphlet of the 2019 BBF at Federation Square in Melbourne. Buddhist birthday festivals in different cities may vary according to the local conditions, but Buddha bathing and blessing ceremonies are indispensable and a central part of the festival. There are also other interreligious uh, other religious ceremonies such as interfaith prayers, blessing ceremonies for baby and mother, etc. And quoting the organizer's official website, there is much to see and hear, do and learn. This includes meditation and Dharma talks for those who wish to learn or to experience Buddhist practices, activities to keep children entertained, a multicultural stage to showcase music and dance from diverse cultures and many more. So as the program shows, the festival tries to cater to a spectrum of visitors from the uninitiated to the practitioners, spanning a broad range in age, language, and culture. So one can imagine that it is necessary to keep innovating to attract return visitors to this annual event. So let me quickly go over our research methods. An interview was conducted online on 9th January this year involving 19 key personnel from Bo Guangshan temples and BLI chapters in ANZ, some of whom are present today. Interviewees included the Chief Abbess of Bo Guangshan ANZ, Venerable Man Ko, as well as key Bo Guangshan monastic who played crucial roles in the festival for five years or more. All BLIA interviewees have been intimately involved in the planning and execution of BBMs in leadership roles with a mean of 17.4 years of service and a median of 20 years. The group interview was conducted through semi-structured open-ended questions to allow interviewees to tell the stories and narrate their experiences. Interviewees were also asked to validate information that 
Eliang and I have collected. We collected data from archival documents throughout the years. Wu Huangshan has maintained an extensive set of documents, including commemorative books, program booklets, speeches, photographs, and videos. We also referred to publicly available resources, such as dedicated event websites and news articles on the festivals in our analysis. Research data gathered from archival documents and the interview were cross-checked and critically analyzed. I would like now to invite Xiaoyang to present how the flows of innovation work across the trans-regional Foguangshan network. Xiaoyang, please. Thank you, Venerable Chiaoyang. So in our research, we found that in Foguangshan, not only were innovations made, made, but they were made to flow. We identified four broad patterns of flow. Number one on the top left corner, innovations originating from the Foguangshan headquarters that flow onto the regional center Nantian temple, and then the branch temples around ANZ. Number two on the top right corner, innovations within the ANZ network of temples that lack any evidence of an origin from headquarters. So these ideas often but do not exclusively originate from the regional center, and there is evidence of ideas stemming from the branch temples themselves. Number three, on the bottom left corner, innovations from the ANZ region that flow to the headquarters and onto the global network of Foguangshan temples, and number four, innovations that flow between regional centers that are independent of the headquarters. So in this presentation, we have selected a few innovations that exemplify these four kinds of flow that occur between the different units in the Foguangshan network. And notably, many of these innovations continue to evolve as they flow through the oceanic region in the hands of the local branch temples and under local conditions. A very quick note, we evaluate innovativeness using a combination of self-referential and local referential approaches as defined in Castaner and Campus paper published in 2001. So by this definition, we include innovations that range from those that arise out of novel combination of existing elements or incremental innovations to those that depart markedly from existing traditions or radical innovations. So let's start with flows from the Foguangshan headquarters to the regional center and branch temples in ANZ. The first example is the celebration of the Buddha's birthday in public space. When the Foguangshan monastic order first started its mission in Australia, the first BBF celebration in 1991 happened inside a temple in a Western Sydney suburb. But BBF did not remain inside the temple for long. In 1993, the festival was named the Food Fair of Celebration for Buddha's Birthday and was moved to a neighboring park. And two years later, Foguangshan hosted its first public BBF celebration in Darling Harbor, which as many of you would know, is a tourist spot and traffic hub in the heart of Sydney with a high volume of visitors, and it has continued to do so annually until 2019. According to Venerable Manco, the primary motivation for the move was to accommodate the growing number of visitors, mostly immigrant Buddhists in the beginning. We believe that in the move to a public space, Foguangshan is equally motivated by a missionary intent, and that is to engage with the local non-immigrant society and to introduce the message of Buddhism. And this move actually fits well with the three missionary methods described by Stuart Chandler. Number one, creating links of affinity. Number two, sparking people's curiosity. And number three, localizing Buddhist teachings and practice. And the use of these methods will become apparent in later parts of the presentation. So while the celebration of Buddha's birthday outside the temple in Sydney was the, its first in Australia, that was not the first time for Guangshan has brought the BBF out to public space. And so in other words, the move to bring BBF to a prominent public space has its precedence in the order. And that uh, happened in 1958 in a small town called Yilan in Northeast Taiwan. 
And in that year, Venerable Master mobilized 30,000 people, which is equivalent to 60% of the population in town, to host a citywide parade to celebrate the Buddha's birthday. That was significant in three different ways. Uh, first, the parade happened amidst a time of nationwide martial law. Number two, it is a relatively large scale event. And number three, it is a demonstration of the centrality of the historic Buddha as the founder of the religion, according to the doctrine of uh, humanistic Buddhism. So in this case, what we see is that this innovative move of staging BBF in a public space flow from the headquarters to the regional Foguangshan Center in Nantian Temple near Sydney. And after the successful staging of BBF at Darling Harbor, other branch temples across ANZ followed suit. In 1997, Chongtian Temple in Queensland organized its first BBF in public at South Bank in the heart of Brisbane City. BBF celebration in Brisbane has since grown to become one of the biggest Buddha's birthday celebrations in the country. Fuquangshan, Melbourne first celebrated Buddha's birthday outside the temple at City Square in 1996. And since 2003, the festival has been held yearly in Federation Square, also in the heart of the city. And on the West Coast in 2004, FGS Western Australia moved its BBF from the temple to Supreme Court Gardens under the endorsement and invitation by Perth City Council. The festival has now become one of the top five events in the state's cultural calendar. Across the Tasman Sea in New Zealand, uh, Buddha's birthday festival have been held at public spaces such as Alti Square in Auckland and Cathedral Square in Christchurch before being brought back to temple grounds in 2007 and 2010. So in Auckland, this coincided with the completion of the temple building. And as explained by the abbess, it was a decision to bring people to the temple. Buddha's birthday celebrations in New Zealand have since remained in the temple. And this departure from its Australian counterparts has implications in the further diversification of BBF in the two countries, which will be discussed later. So bringing the festival out into prominent public space has created new conditions that the local organizers have continued to adapt and leverage to draw audiences to humanistic Buddhism. And in fact, the organizers are challenged to make the annual BBF accessible and attractive to a diverse crowd while at the same time remaining true to its original objective of celebrating the Buddha's birthday and remembering his gift of Dharma. So we see fireworks, street performances, super banners featuring the Buddha image, petting zoo as part of the vegetarianism campaign, and all these are just some of the skillful means used in BBF. So among these, some innovations have more significant cultural and spiritual connotations than others. For example, the light it up ceremony at the 2021 BBF at Federation Square in Melbourne is an immersive digital light show that retells the Buddha's life story in a modern and innovative way. Also in Melbourne, the Mindfulness Forest is a collection of illuminated columns that invite viewers to color on forming a creative sanctuary for those seeking peace and calm. And um, staging a festival in public space also brings new opportunities for collaborations with the local community, charitable organizations, and educational institutions. So these pictures illustrate some of the collaborations forged between FGS and various local groups. On the left, the planting of a body tree transplanted from Sri Lanka was a collaborative project between Chongtian Temple in Queensland and the Queensland Gallery of Modern Art. On the right, a dragon boat race held in conjunction with BBF in Brisbane was a collaboration with the local Dragon Boat Club. Interfaith prayers and family-friendly satellite events at BBF also serve as platforms of interaction between Foguangshan and the wider community to forge friendship, mutual respect, and understanding. 
And BBF is also a significant occasion through which support and endorsement was garnered from local community and the government. So in this uh, video recorded message of support for the 2021 festival, the Australian Prime Minister say, and I quote, Buddhism has a strong history in Australia and the contribution of Buddhist thought to our culture and society is greatly valued. In a time of increasing global uncertainty and unrest, the Buddha's teaching of equality, respect and understanding have growing relevance to all who wish to build a more caring and a more peaceful world, unquote. So such messages affirm the efforts of Fo Guangshan in bringing the Buddha's teachings beyond its circle of devotees to the wider local communities through BBF. And all these were made possible by taking a festival into public space year after year. So we reflected a little on what made it possible to organize uh, the Buddha's birthday festival in public space. And we found um, several factors. So first we think it is the autonomy of the different organizing committees and the independent finances shielded by Foguangshan ANZ without any assistance from headquarters. In addition, the move was also made possible by the motivation to engage the locals to introduce humanistic Buddhism. The smoothness in engagement with local authority to secure this um, spot at prominent public spaces. And last but not least, a permissive stance of the headquarters. We now look at a second example of the flow from headquarters to the region of Oceania. And this is the campaign, uh, Three Acts of Goodness, to do good deeds, speak good words, and think good thoughts. It is one of Fo Guangshan's signature campaign in its effort to make Buddhism accessible and cultivating wholesome physical, verbal, and mental karma cuts across all Buddhist traditions. So it is a classical example of um, an application of humanistic Buddhism to translate the doctrine into a language that can be easily understood, um, applicable in daily life and in accordance with what the Buddha taught. In 2010, then president of Taiwan, Ma Yingjiu, led a collective pledge to the three acts of goodness or three G as we will refer to it um, in the following slides in the National Buddha's Birthday Celebration. And this event made a connection between 3G and Buddha's birthday celebrations for Fo Guangshan. Soon after, this innovation flowed to the BBF in ANZ, which incorporated the three acts of goodness into its celebrations, as we shall see in the next few slides. So here we see one of the ways by which the message of 3G was incorporated into Buddha's birthday celebration. The traditional Buddha bathing ritual involves scooping water over the shoulders of the little Prince Siddhartha statue three times while reciting the Buddha bathing gatha that you see on the left. In 2010, at the festival in Sydney, the three acts of goodness was incorporated into the verses. As one bathed the little Buddha, one may recite, I vow to do good deeds, speak good words, and think good thoughts. So three acts of goodness became the theme of the 2012 BBF in Sydney. And it has been given physical form that you can see here in the form of two meter tall mascots imported from Taiwan. BBF New Zealand incorporated the three acts of goodness into its Buddha bathing cards in 2014 and Perth 2016. Since then, the message of 3G continued to be an important recurring theme in BBF and was repeatedly featured and um, expanded in various satellite activities surrounding the festivals. For example, BBF organizers in Perth hosted the Three Acts of Goodness photography competition, whereas in New Zealand, the Three Acts of Goodness and Four Givings were creatively integrated to form the theme of the 3G, 4G festival, which we will hear more about later. So incorporating the 3G into BBF and staging BBF in public space demonstrated a flow from the headquarters to the oceanic region where there were variable extents of uptake as well as diversification in the different cities. So apart from the above mentioned flows that originated at the headquarters, there were also practices in relation to the festivals that have emerged in Pacific context. 
Here we look at the flows that happen within the transregional for Guangshan network of Australia and New Zealand. In Taiwan, the Foguangshan headquarters celebrates Buddha's birthday on the eighth day of the fourth month in the lunar calendar, officiated as a public holiday since 1999. Across the Oceania, however, BBF are held across the months of April and May, and the 2019 calendar you see here was typical. The first festivals took place the weekend before Easter in New Zealand and Perth, followed by Nantian Temple, Wollongong in New South Wales during the Easter weekend. Brisbane ran its three-day festival during the first weekend of May, followed by Sydney over the Mother's Day weekend and ending with Melbourne the following weekend. So extending the celebration was an innovation, but essentially a response to the limitation of human resources for the festivals in Oceania. The chief abbess was expected to preside over the official ceremony in all the festivals in Australia. Other monastics also had to travel interstate to support the rituals and to deliver Dharma talks. For example, at least six monastics were required to officiate the Buddha bathing ceremony, but not all states had enough local monastics. And beside the monastics, each branch temple depended on a team of lay volunteers organized under the local BLIA chapters to support the festival. When the special need arose, arose, lay volunteers would have to travel to support the festivals in other cities. The ease of travel across ANZ enabled people to fly across the regions to support and to learn from one another. This is one characteristic of global Buddhism that Bowman highlighted. And such occasions for travel became opportunities for exchange of information and ideas across the Pacific region. So let me now turn to the 3G, 4G festival that was the brainchild of the abbots of Foguangshan, New Zealand. 3G stands for do good deeds, speak good words and think good thoughts. And 4G, give others confidence, give others joy, hope and convenience. Having moved the festival back to temple grounds since 2007 and 2010, the organizers in New Zealand could now fully utilize the temple's indoor and outdoor space to create this festival. So this festival became an extended Buddha's birthday celebration that catered to school children from different parts of the country. It has a cumulative number of 17,000 visitors over six years since 2009. So the extension of Buddha's birthday celebration demonstrates how an innovative practice that emerged out of local needs also created new conditions for the branches to continue to diversify and to enhance local accessibility to the Triple Gem. Innovations flow across the ANZ branches through formal meetings and personal friendships. Mutual learning and cross-fertilization of ideas resulted in further local adaptations. So the pictures here illustrate ideas that help to make Buddha bathing easy and fun for children, Buddha bathing stations customized for children, Lumbini Garden designed as a children's playground. They were just some of the ideas that we found circulating across the different states. And speaking about making the Buddha more accessible, other ideas are cartoon Buddha, mascot Buddha, stickers, and balloons. And making the Sangha and Dharma more accessible, we found the use of arms round during the festival with the leader distributing Dharma cards quite innovative. Here we see a modified version of arms round where the Sangha procession move across the festival ground as the crowd gathered to give donations towards education, including fundraising for Nantian Institute. And regardless of whether they made a contribution or not, everyone would receive a Dharma card that often comes with words of wisdom from the founding master. And using the 3G mascots that you saw earlier was another way to make the Dharma more accessible and it was used across all states. So far, we have looked at two different kinds of flow. And we know that while outward flows from, of innovations from the headquarters to branches were the most common pattern, the flow of innovations in the Foguangshan network was far from unidirectional. The third kind of flow we saw was a flow from the ANZ region back to the headquarters. 
Vegetarianism is a method of cultivation to nurture compassion and a big part of the Chinese Mahayana Buddhist culture. Since the very first Buddha's birthday celebration in Sydney, the food fair, the vegetarian food fair has been ubiquitously associated with BBF. And across Oceania, the vegetarian food fair further inspired many ideas in promoting vegetarianism, including the Be Kind Be Vigo or BKBV campaign that you see here. Inspired by multiple resources, BKBV was launched in 2016 in Sydney. BKBV was innovative in transforming a traditional Mahayana practice into an online pledge. During the interview, we were told that temples in Singapore and Malaysia have run vegetarian campaigns during the seventh month in the lunar calendar for many years. In the BKBV campaign, the organizers aspired to go beyond the boundaries of the usual target audience of the temple to reach a wider segment of the community. 11% of the Australian population are vegetarians or vegans, and that outnumbered the Australian Buddhist population, which makes up only 2.4%, according to the Bureau of Statistics. The campaign first featured as roadshows in BBF in Sydney, Melbourne, and Perth in 2016 and 17. And the turning point came when in 2017, BRIA Sydney presented the project at an international BRIA conference held in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and called for its adoption by the headquarters. The headquarters took up the project in 2018 and renamed it Veggie Plan A. So in this campaign, the elements of universality and environmental consciousness were further strengthened, and it answers to several of the UN Sustainable Development Goals on protection of environment and lives. While retaining the key feature of an online pledge, Veggie Plan A has moved beyond the geographic boundaries of its predecessor, BKBV, and has been taken to the global Foguangshan network. Various different Foguangshan and BRIA groups in North America, Southeast Asia, and other parts of the world have reinvented it in different forms as can be seen from these photographs. And as a result of the various incremental reinventions, a total of close to 400,000 pledges have been collected and the number is still constantly growing. And the fourth kind of flow that we saw was the flow between branch temples from different regions of the world that is not mediated directly by headquarters. And we illustrate this pattern of flow with the project called uh, Buddha's Birthday Education Project or BBEP for short. BBEP is one of the satellite projects at BBF and it aims to educate and inspire people about the historic birth of the Buddha. The project uses modern and creative means to transform canonical texts about the spread of Buddhism and about the celebration of Buddha's birthday into accessible formats to contextualize Buddhist rituals and story for a contemporary audience. The main artifacts of BBEP include a triptych of a Buddha's birthday procession in Luoyang, China from the early sixth century, an animation piece of a technologically advanced altar carriage in China during the fourth century, and a silk rope depiction of the spread of Buddhism. The project was started uh, by Venerable Jueiwei while at Silai Temple, which is the Foguangshan Regional Headquarters in the Americas. And from Silai Temple, BBEP went on roadshows around Southern California and to the Natural History Museum in Las Vegas. Since then, the roadshows continued across America during the BBFs. The project was reinvented to become part of the ANZ Buddha's birthday festivals when Venerable Jueiwei was posted to Nantian Institute in Wulongong. And in 2012, the BBEP reproduced the main artifacts from America, but also invited Australian artists to create local impressions of Buddha's birthday legends. And the result was an exhibition of eight original artifacts from artists based in New South Wales. A range of Dharma-inspired products and applications were also developed for BBEP over the next few years, 
including a mindful check-in app that we use um, uh, at the beginning of this talk and also in NTI. So over the years, creative products included handmade books of significance, board games, Dharma card sets, videos, and more that were shared between LA and Sydney. And from Sydney, the project traveled to BBF in Melbourne, Perth, and Brisbane, and also to Malaysia in 2015. Three years later, BBEP made a return to the Buddha Museum at Fogongshan headquarters with an Australian delegation of 20. A video of the making of the carriage was showcased to 1 million visitors over a period of six months. And BBEP itself was showcased as part of a major collaboration between the Buddha Museum and Durham University's exhibition of Walking with Buddha. This return marked a closure to the BBEP. During these seven years, the project was part of a dynamic growth of BBF in Australia, contributing new artifacts every year. The flow pattern of BBEP indicates that multi-directional dynamic is possible within this system. Innovations do not have to start from the top. BBEP was created and transmitted by grassroots efforts. In fact, it suggests that such flows are free to occur once the network structure of the global FGS system became established. In the case of BBEP, rotational posting of a monastic brought the project across the Pacific, where it took root and extended to other parts of Asia, including the headquarters. So to summarize the four kinds of flow that we saw in the Foguangshan network, number one, innovations originating from the headquarters that flow onto the regional center and the branch temples around ANZ. Number two, innovations within the ANZ network of temples that lack any evidence of an origin from headquarters. Number three, innovations from the ANZ region that flow to the headquarters and to the global network of Foguangshan temples. And number four, innovations that flow between the regional centers and that are independent of the headquarters. So in this process, innovations were kept alive, adapted and diversified. Some of them became what we would call lily pads for other innovations to emerge. And now I invite Venerable Jerry back for the final part of our presentation. Thank you, Xiaoyang. We have had close to 50 minutes of presentations. And in order to avoid Zoom fatigue, I would like to invite everyone again. Let's take half a minute to pause, close our eyes and relax. And again, I will let you know when the 30 second mark is up. Thank you, everybody. I'd like now to reflect on the factors that made the flows we have identified possible. We acknowledge that there are several external factors at play, which include the faithful Chinese diaspora, changes in the government's immigration policy, a trend towards cultural and religious pluralism, and the technologies and trends in travel and communication. More importantly, we think that it would have been impossible to make use of these external conditions if the organization for Guangshan was not ready or equipped to do so. Therefore, we decided in this paper to focus on two intrinsic factors that enabled innovations to happen and to flow in the Fo Guangshan network. We think the culture and the structure of the organization together have made it possible for innovations to flow. Let's start with the inspiration and encouragement from the founder. Fo Guangshan has always maintained a relatively open attitude to innovations. The founder himself said that Buddhism is meant to be practical. 
And this pragmatic spirit of humanistic Buddhism led him to interpret and promote the teachings in innovative ways. As early as the 1950s, Venerable Master pioneered the use of a slide projector to teach the Dharma, and that was in 1953. He also formed the first Buddhist choir in 1954 and cut the first record of Buddhist songs in 1957 in Taiwan. It is also important to recognize that innovations cannot stray too far from tradition, as tradition may then become unrecognizable. In Amanda Lucia's study of innovative gurus, she discovered that while reinventing the mechanisms in which, in which teachings are delivered, most innovative teachers rely on tradition to some extent to, quote, garner recognizability and authority, unquote. This may explain how Fo Guangshan did not wander away from that tradition and possibly also why the historical Buddha is central to humanistic Buddhism. Even when displayed in public place, places, Buddha images took the center stage. As Xiaoyan demonstrated through the examples, we find that innovations get recreated, adapted, or may even enable further innovations. So in their research to look at how organizations pursue high impact innovations effectively, Sinfield and Solis talked about enabling innovations. So let me use um, the BBF to show you how this lily pad strategy works. A significant number of BBF related innovations by FGS and Z can be seen as enabling innovations. So let's look at the 3G, three acts of goodness campaign. On the first path, the passage gets incorporated into the Buddha bathing gatha. It then inspired the creative configuration of the children's bathing stations that you saw in earlier slides. Along a separate path of innovations, the 3G, 3G message becomes the theme of satellite BBF events, such as the photo competition and drawing competition shown in earlier slides. These events then continue to happen alongside BBF or grow to become independent events of their own, such as the signature 3G, 4G festival in New Zealand. Reflecting further on BBF related practices, we refer to the work of Thomas Sordis, who proposed that two primary features, portable practice and transposable message are necessary for a new religion to be exported to a foreign environment. So by portable practice is meant rites and rituals that can be easily learned. So we looked at meditation that has proven to be a portable Buddhist practice. The organizers capitalized on existing features of the location and customized the meditation experience for visitors, many of whom were first time meditators. Then we have looked at the 3G that we feel is a transposable message. It distills the core Buddhist teachings of cultivation in one's body, speech, and mind into a universal message that's easy to understand and act on for all ages, as well as in a diverse range of cultural settings. So from here, I'd like to move on to, from the culture of innovation, I'd like to move on to the model that captures the trans-regional flows and dynamics of interactions. And in our search, we came across a model that we find useful, and that is the system of systems. So the complexity of the flows of Fo Guangshan suggests that we're not just operating in one system with different parts, but instead is a system of many ind independent, but yet also collaborating systems. So, we propose to use the Bodman and Saucer definition of the characteristics of a system of systems to describe the organizing committees and how they work together. So the features are one, autonomy. The temple and the BLI chapter at each location operated autonomously with respect to the BBFs through their own independent organizing committees comprising local volunteers and each constituent could be viewed as a large and complex system itself. 
and proof of independence could be seen from the naming of the festival. Sydney and Perth called this annual event Buddha's Birthday Multicultural Festival. Brisbane named it Buddha Birthday. Melbourne, Buddha's Day and Multicultural Festival. Christchurch calls it Buddha's Day Multicultural Festival for World Peace. And Auckland calls it Buddha's Birthday Multicultural Festival. And each independent committee has runs its own fundraising programs. Second characteristic of belonging. The respective BBF committees did not belong to a supra organization, but reported on their work through their respective branch temples and chapters voluntarily. Since 2012, the report of BBFs from around the world took place after the annual monastic seminar at headquarters in Kaohsiung, Taiwan. Temples with organized BBFs earlier that year were invited to present their innovations to all other temples. Discussions included sharing of ideas and resources, a fair bit of learning, and friendly contestation. In addition, Bo Guangshan ANZ also held annual regional monastic seminars where local temples shared their ideas and successes. It's sessions such as these that often led to proactive exchange of resources and ideas relating to BBS. Third, connectivity. The connectivity among temples around Fo Guangshan usually came through their personal friendships, and that meant that ideas could be captured by any temple after these annual meetings. There are also the chief abbots as well as volunteers who fly across the states, and they represent a very strong um, uh, leveraged network for diversity. The capabilities of the VBF committees of each region were quite diverse. For example, in some committees, they were largely run by youth, while in others, decision-making was dominated by experienced adults. As a result, we noticed different types of innovations taking place. For example, Perth was the first to take on online booking of mass meditation events as young adults played a dominant role in the organizing committee. Emergence. The PBS system of systems was rich in emergent capability. We were told that the temples had a free hand in suggesting and implementing major innovations, such as taking the festivities to public spaces without consulting with the headquarters. And now our final words, which I hope to do in the next minute. In this presentation, we first laid out the four types of trans-regional flows we saw from the data. Then we set out to examine BBFs in Fo Guangshan as a system of systems by focusing on how innovations were enabled in one of its most heavily invested and longest running flagship projects. BBFs have been continuously reinvented in myriad ways in the different ANZ cities to align to local policies and to thrive as a community event in the increasingly multicultural and religiously plural landscapes of Australia and New Zealand. A review of historical data in the interview indicated that Fo Guangshan's culture of innovation has played a major role in shaping its members' open attitude to innovation and willingness to take risks. This culture of innovation fed into an organizational learning framework that made the accumulation of institutional knowledge possible. Fo Guangshan and BLIA maintained inbuilt formal mechanisms of organizational learning through annual seminars and news archives. Vibrant flows and exchanges of knowledge and ideas were made possible by the ease of travel and rotational monastic posting. We hope that this piece of research adds richness to the global Buddhism that was first defined by Bauman 20 years ago, and also to ultra-modern Buddhism, where both tradition and modernity coexist. Today's presentation is made possible because of the contribution of people who took time to supply us with data and check our assertions, as well as colleagues who reviewed earlier drafts of our papers. We also thank the Xingyun Education Foundation for funding this research. And we also thank you for your gift of infinite patience as we made this presentation. We now hand back to Anna to facilitate the Q&A session and we hope you don't ask too many difficult questions. 
Thank you, Venerable Zhu Wei, and thank you, Xu Yan, for your really fascinating presentation. So we're now going to stop sharing the slides and go back to the screen where we can see you all. And we welcome questions from the floor. Um, as Venerable Zhu Wei said, I think it's particularly interesting to me uh, this case study, which shows uh, the way in which for Guanshan's Buddhism across the Pacific, uh, the innovation draws on both traditional and modern aspects, which evokes uh, frameworks of, of as Van Bujiwei said, ultramodern Buddhism, but also obviously Nat Natalie Quilly's earlier work in this field. I also find it particularly interesting the attention uh, paid here to flows of Buddhism, both um, in and out of Australia and in and out of the Pacific region to and from Asia and to and from North America, which again evokes for me the earlier work of uh, one of our colleagues who's here today, Christina Rocha. And um, so, Please come forward with any questions. Uh, you can put your hands up using the reactions button. I think Christina, is that a hand up? <laughs> uh, yes. And um, but you can also put comments in the chat. So whatever you would prefer. So Christina is going to start us off with the first question. Yeah, first of all, um, congratulations. I really enjoyed the paper. It was beautifully laid out and really interesting. So that was fantastic. Um, I was wondering, um, you have a wonderful uh, engagement with the community. How is that translated into people coming in um, to Buddhism and coming into the temple and try and becoming part of of uh, either BLIA or the, the, the institute itself or coming to study, how is that translated? Do you have any numbers or what people are looking for when they come, um, how they imagine what Buddhism is and then you have to you know, clarify that a few things you don't do or how does that work? Yes, I will, I will do my part and I'll hand over to Xiaoyan to supplement. So, I'll explain from the Buddha's birthday education project that um, I run here. So as a satellite activity, I had, an, I had an opportunity to work with a core team of volunteers, some of whom are online today. And that really, I think, brought in people who may not know very much about the Buddha, who didn't know very much about Buddhism. And they started their journey as volunteers. Over time, they become core volunteers. So there are different levels of volunteering. So one is you just come during the weekend. And over time, they become more invested in the project. Then they come over um, even during our planning times, which usually take place at least half a year before. And we build, as we built our assets, all those, all those um, apps, multimedia assets that we have um, developed takes a lot of talent and a lot of time and design. And in the process, that's how people learned about the history of um, Buddhism, about some of the legends that are associated with the Buddha. Then I think after that is when they then get more involved in the whole BBF itself. And there are people flowing either way. So there are volunteers who come through from the BBF main activities into BBEP and there's then greater, um, greater interaction. Many of my BBEP volunteers actually came to take at least a subject with the Nantian Institute. That also increases our learning in Buddhism, in the Dharma from an academic perspective and they flow back again into a BLIA, into Fo Guang Shan. I believe that we've come, we can use these projects as a magnet for attracting interested people, but also as a means for us to expand um, 
what Buddhism means to people. And it's a it's a free, it's a free people can come or they can leave. And then there's another layer, which is the visitors. Now, the visitors without these public festivals may not even know that Fo Guang Shan or Nan Tian exist. So it's with this opportunity we let them know. And every donation, every vegetarian piece of food that they take is an affinity that will blossom in the future. So Xiaoyang, would you like to add to that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Venerable Jerry. You gave a very detailed and comprehensive um, answer to Christina's question. If I were to add anything, it's just from personal experience. So in the temple, we have um, a circle of devotees who always attend regular temple activities. But the Buddha's birthday festival is special in that there is another group of people, you don't see them anywhere else or at any other time in the year. But when Buddha's birthday festival came, they would return and show up at these festivals. So um, we don't have data uh, in terms of numbers, but we know that um, there are people who are connected to the Foguangshan Temple in this way through the Buddha's birthday festivals. Thank you. Yeah, that's very clear. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question here from Kin. Um, Kin, would you like to ask that question or shall I read it out? Hello. Hi. Thank you very, very much for sharing. That was beautiful just to see how much that has been done and um, through such goodwill and good heart. Um, I was wondering, because in the process of innovation, I'm sure that there may be many, many ideas, you know, that would come out. And um, how would you deal or how it was a process when you have in this emergence of selecting and filtering out the ideas and which ones to implement? Um, and especially if something that can be perceived as a disruptive innovation and an idea that would challenge the core values of what would be. And that, and the second question to what I typed out is that, you know, in innovation, there are inevitably um, risk and failures. And if there were any and what was learned from them. Thank you. Thank you, Kian, for the question. Um, Okay, let's let's just start with the first part about how do we select the ideas that come through. And I'll use the again the Buddha's birthday education project as an example because that's what I'm familiar with. Very often when I start on the various new ideas and BBEP is about innovation. Every year we do something different, and every year I'm not sure I can do it. Every year I ask myself, why do I get myself into this kind of trouble? Why must I always attack this mission's impossible? But I realize that what it has created in the process is that, is that I think a team spirit of people coming together to do something which we thought would not be possible and we do it and we manage to accomplish. And what that brings to us, I guess, is faith in one another. And that's very important to us, the faith in the Buddha nature in one, in one another and the faith that what we're doing is for the sake of the Dharma. I have a lot of, um, I guess, faith in the, in the sense that these ideas usually go through a committee. And because it's a committee that we all come together, there is some sense of filtering of knowing whether it works or it doesn't, and of that commitment. I believe that once we commit to something, the chances of success are much higher. And in fact, we often do things against all odds. <laughs> um, and that, that kind of accomplishment is, is the magic, I feel, that I can't explain, but it happens. It's, it's, it's the power of people. So that's one about filtering and emergence of ideas. A lot of times it's the committee that decides and Xiaoyang maybe can, can look at some examples at a broader uh, BBF context. Then second, in terms of disruptive innovations, actually we like disruptions. 
I think that in the BDP, year after year, we try to use technology in a way to, for example, we use apps to do games. So we do Dharma games um, as a Dharma hunt. But at the same time, we also have board games that are physical. And we want to use that to bring families and teachers and students together. Um, so I think that disruptions, especially in terms of technology, is not an issue. The thing is that we must keep to our theme of humanistic Buddhism. We are keeping to the theme of spreading um, the Dharma for the individuals. At least this is what I can identify as an insider of the BEP. But perhaps as a researcher, I would say that I, I could see that the committees do evaluate risks. One is financial. Can it be done with the finances that we have? Um, second, I can see that the committee also takes into account manpower the viability in terms of um, do we have enough volunteers to, to execute the idea and then the in, enough expertise to do so. Yeah. So Xiaoyang, do you have anything to add? So I, I have worked as a volunteer within the lay organization BLIA and um, each BLIA organizing committee is guided by a guiding venerable from Foguangshan and also um, we have um, volunteers that are more experienced than others. So it makes up a group that has different levels of ex expertise, experience, and knowledge. And um, by working as a group, um, through the principle of what Venerable Master Sing Yun called collective creativity, um, that is how we um, make things happen. And that is how we um, select between um, innovations that work or not. And um, we have a very, I would, I would say quite a rapid feedback system. So we would hold feedback meetings right after each activity and try to find out what works and not. So um, that is the mechanism that helps us um, to keep going and keep innovating. Yeah, I don't know. If, yeah, thanks, Kian. I, I also think that, um, you know, there's so much innovations coming out of the festivals in order to be able to make a difference. Like this year is the pandemic year when I saw what, Melbourne has done um, in the federations where it's just very impressive in order to create those um, like towels, mindfulness forests, in order to keep everybody, I guess, um, feeling still, still in a festive mode in spite of the pandemic. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Please don't hesitate to raise your hand or type something in the chat or comments perhaps, uh, um, especially I think there are some who have been here. Or comments in relation to the research. Anyone else? Wow, looks like we can have an early end. <laughs> I think we, it would be good, um, Anna, excuse me, to say that this paper and the other papers in, in, the, in the seminar will come out probably next year as written published papers um, with the Journal of Global Buddhism, which um, so that we will, you know, tell everyone later on. But yeah, look out for that because I think it will be very exciting to have all these papers con you know, collected in one special issue. Yes, certainly. So um, at the end of our session today, and we may indeed finish a little bit earlier, uh, Venerable Jiwe and I were going to speak a little bit more, yeah, uh, as Christine has mentioned, which is fine that you've jumped in, about yes. a special issue and also the upcoming seminars. Okay. Um, Thank you. Anna. So, yeah, just a final call out. Um, B Systemics has their hand up. Yeah, hi, sorry, I just have a question. I was wondering um, whether you can gauge uh, what is the role of shared values? Um, what role does it play in uh, how your teams operate? Shared values is key. I think that um, for all the committees, why we have nine months of planning 
or rather why I, I think what we saw is nine months of planning for many of the various um, committees is to create that shared value and that shared understanding. And that was that, and they came through also as the as each um, task force encounters difficulties. There are, we've seen monthly meetings being held for in order for them to coordinate, for them to um, learn from one another. So definitely guided by shared values. Xiaoyang? Oh, I don't have anything to add. I, I agree with that. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Kin or has final raised comment? Hand. I think Kin has raised her hand. Um, Kin? actually, I was going to ask about the shared values and how that evolved from 3G to 4G, but maybe that's a very evolved, I mean, involved um, explanation and I could just take it offline. I think otherwise it would might take too long. Actually for us, it's not, uh, for Fo Huang Shan, it's not that complicated because there's plenty of publications from the founder. So the okay. founder has, has many handbooks, publications, writings that the committees can refer to. Then also there are annual monastic seminars that are held as well as annual BLIA um, executive seminars that are held. So that's maintained throughout. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry. I'm, this is my first time. So just to everyone. Yeah, I guess I was interested about the 4G, if how oh. that evolved. Yeah, I mean, I understand about the 3G, but um, I think it was just a 4G part, but probably another discussion for the future. But well, thank you very much. I think 4G came from the power of the gift, which is as it is a uh, Mahayana Buddhism, where Bodhisattva values are very core. And the first practice um, among the six perfections is the, power, is the perfection of generosity. So the power of the gift. And what about the power of the gift? So the founder put out these four um, attributes that he thinks people want joy. So we want the power to give joy and people are living in, a, in our sphere. So to give confidence, to give hope and in order for bodhisattvas to serve, to give convenience. Thank you very much. I think it's very appropriate right here now, you know, as we are in the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Kian. Thank you. Are there any final questions or comments before we speak a little bit more about the series, the seminar series and the network and the special issue? I just, if I may, I just a comment. Sure. Yeah. Of course. Um, just wanted to know how much of, uh, I mean, from an organizational point of view, this is uh, probably something that would be very interesting for other organizations, not just for these organizations, but the mechanism of innovation. Everyone is after innovation. So I really hope that um, this is something that you can potentially translate into. Uh, Organizations that are not necessarily uh, like for one China, you know, like a, more like a, a commercial or business, more more business oriented organizations, and potentially instill them with uh, other ways of thinking about uh, how people work together. Just an idea. Yeah, I I think so too. That now more than ever. Um, adapting to new environments, innovations, um, resilience. I mean, these are all the keywords that will be required and it takes certain conditions. I think what Xiaoyang and I have found in the schools of research is that it's not just, I want to be innovative and I will be. It takes culture. I think it takes, and culture means people starting from the top to everyone in the organization, building up the culture of innovation um, and even when we have innovation, we have learned that you need the transposable messages and the portable practices that could go global with, that we can go global with. Then also a model to, to view 
and to structure these innovations. Well, these are just this is just a start of what we think are some enabling factors, and of course, there are different types of innovation. What we are what we are pro, um, what we are seeing from Guo Guangshan's Buddhist Birthday Festivals is that innovation doesn't have to take a leap, doesn't have to be disruptive all the time. It could be incremental, this lily pad enabling innovations, but really takes teamwork. And teamwork in a system of systems requires a structure to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? It certainly is an interesting way to end, actually, you know, in the way that you're applying um, theories pertaining to innovation to your study of Foguan Shan in the islands of Buddhism, but that also Buddhist social theory inspired through the case study, what you learn in the case study could then report back and help to innovate uh, within theories of innovation. <laughs> so thank you for that final um, question. And um, there certainly may be something in that. Um, Okay, so I think we will probably finish a little bit early, but just before we do, I'm just going to quickly speak uh, about the special issue and then Venerable Jue is going to quickly speak about the seminar and then we will have a group photograph at the end. So please stay with us for just a little bit longer. Uh, so as Christina mentioned, so this, this network formed very organically. I was doing some research together with colleagues at Deakin and Charles Darwin University, and also in consultation with Christina at Western Sydney University uh, on Buddhism in Australia. And I started to notice that some of the things, some of the patterns that I was seeing here were more similar to what I had seen also happen in New Zealand and particularly in Hawaii than uh, say Buddhism in, um, other parts of the so-called West of Europe and North America. And um, I think obviously that is because of our the region that we're in, the Pacific region, but also the geographical proximity to Asia and also very rich history in Australia, New Zealand and in Hawaii of indigenous cultures that um, are very much still alive and present uh, and uh, the way those relationships also have affected Buddhism in these countries and the fact that we're islands and um, parts of us and sometimes all of us are in tropical regions where the climate is also very similar to Asia. And so the aesthetic is also very different here, let's say, than um, Europe or North America. So we started really looking at these ideas and then combining them together with Christina's work on flows of Buddhism. And, and working together with Nantian, uh, given that Foguan Chan is such a fascinating case study for some of this movement around the Pacific uh, region of ideas, as well as people and temples and, and everything. So, so we came together as a network of scholars. We reached out to people that we knew of. And as Christina said, we decided as an output that um, we would have a, a, a work towards a special issue, hopefully in the Journal of Global Buddhism. And so we have papers now submitted by all of the members of the seminar series. I won't say them now because Venerable Jue is about to share these details with you. And so these papers have all been drafted now um, and submitted for an internal peer review by the editors of the special issue. And then they will, they, some of them have already gone back to the authors for, um, uh, so it's a very critical academic scholarly process, I think. Like, so even though a lot of us are insiders within uh, the movement, um, it, it's it's going through this um, first round of peer review, but then it will also go through peer review, a normal peer review process through the Journal of Global Buddhism. And I think all the papers will be greatly strengthened by that and particularly theoretically as well. So um, I will now turn over to ben Venerable Jue. As Christina said, this special issue hopefully will be published next year. Um, as you all know, this is still quite a process and takes time. Um, but Venerable Jue will, will tell you about all of the seminars and I'm gonna sign off for now and Venerable Jue will end the session. And then we have been asked for a photograph at the end, Venerable Jue as well. So we make sure we, we do that too. Okay, thank you again to everyone for being here. Thank you, Anna.
I just want to thank everyone for your presence and your questions. This is really our webinar today is part of a series. So Anna started us off last month and we will have another three more in the coming, in the coming few months. It's always on the third Thursday of every month and at this time. Next time, we are going to welcome Venerable Karma Lakshe Somo to present on her Japanese Buddhist Women in Hawaii research. So everyone, please come back again next month. You can use the same link or you can share our, um, the link that's there, the event right registration link there and um, invite more friends to come along. Anybody whom you feel will be interested. And we do, as Anna say, have a network, a Buddhism in the Sea of Islands um, research network. If you're interested in joining us, also please write to us and we'll be very happy to welcome you into our research circle. I'd like to end by perhaps all of us checking out and transferring merits together as is the practice again in, um, here in um, Nantian Institute. So if you'll join me, please. Whoops, whoops, sorry. Here. Let us now dedicate the goodness of what you have done to all living beings. May kindness, compassion, joy and equanimity pervade all worlds. May we cherish and build affinities to benefit all beings. May Chan, Pure Land, and precepts inspire equality and patience. May our gratitude and humility give rise to great vows. <laughs> <laughs>